Some of you might have had other things you might have done on a Friday night, so I'm really tickled that you're here. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Um, here we go. You can already see the title, and I guess you knew that already. Um, I was flying back from California two weeks ago, exactly two weeks ago, in fact, and I had the fortune to uh, have a window seat, and it was still light outside. I glanced out the window, and we were flying over deserts, beautiful snow-covered mountains, lakes, and uh, I couldn't help but just appreciate the view and think, well, if I were a poet, I would have written about what I was seeing, but I'm a scientist, so I had a different impulsive thought. My impulsive thought was more along the lines of, we've discovered so many, literally hundreds of new planets orbiting other stars, uh, I wonder what the scene would look like if I were flying over one of them. Um, don't know, maybe someday we will. Anyway, that's a little bit of the scientist's perspective, and I want to share that with you tonight. So let's take a journey together through time and space. Uh, let's first travel four million years back into the past. So I'd like to invite you to close your eyes just for a moment, and then open them again and imagine yourself as one of our human ancestors. Not that one. That one doesn't look so good. That one. So, let's say you see your dinner a couple of hundred yards off in the distance, but it's running away faster than your feet will carry you. You give up in exasperation as you watch a three-star meal get away. So your first thought might be, nuts, I'm late for dinner again. But as you stop to catch your breath, you notice that the animal, the animal you were stalking recedes toward the horizon and eventually disappears. So picture yourself as that person. A second thought crosses your mind. Where did it go? Then a flood of questions pour into your mind. Can I go there too? What's out there? Uh, the lore of the unknown. This guy is an, un is an explorer. Can't you see that happening? We humans are explorers. We're curious. We're puzzle solvers. Tell us something is unknown, and we want to know it. Tell us something isn't understood, and we want to understand it. Now, some of you are adults. Maybe all of you are adults. Yeah, okay. There are a few kids in here. I hope there are a few kids. Good, okay, because I have a question for the kids. Um, so if you're an adult, in your daily lives, you may have forgotten all about what it's like to be a kid, but all of us start out with a sort of innate curiosity. So what made you curious as a kid? If you're a parent, do you remember being stumped by the amazing questions your children asked about the world? In case you don't know what I'm talking about, let's hear from a few of our younger audience members. So are there some, maybe one or two youngsters in the audience who I could call upon to tell me what they're curious about? Thank you. That's okay, take your time. Any question comes to mind? What do you stump your parents on when you, when you ask a question and they say, hmm, I don't know, I'll have to check. Something about black holes, okay. Um, we can come back to you too. Is somebody in the back have an idea? Is there life on other planets? That's a great one. Lots of kids want to know that. Me too. Anyone else? Do you, did your thought come back to you? Something about black holes? Yes. Okay, what is it? Uh, I was wondering what was inside a black hole. What's inside a black hole? Yes. I can't touch that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Anyone else? Okay, so we'll move on. But. I guess I want to leave you with the thought, where does this come from? I don't know, but it's special. It's in all of us, 
it starts out in all of us and some of us sort of lose it as we go along. Um, so here's a message to you kids. Don't stop asking those questions. If a big person tells you, I don't know, then maybe you're on to something. Like I just told you, I don't know. You just might ask a question to which nobody has the answer. Something like, how did we get here? Or are Earthlings alone? You can actually make it your job to look for the answers. That's what I did. I'd be the first to admit that I never grew up. And my wife and family are here in the audience and they can vouch for that. <laughs> I never stopped asking questions, just learned how to do it, hopefully well, and how to pursue the answers. So I want to tell you at some level what is science. And it may not sound like what you learn in school. It'll relate to what you might have learned in school, but maybe this isn't exactly how it's taught. So science starts with a good question. And it's not just any question, it has to be a good question. So what makes a good question? Well, in science, a good question is a question that can be answered through a combination of experiments, theory, analysis, um, but thought and discovery. So it's, it has to be a good question to be a scientific question. A good answer is one that stands the test of time. Now in science, lots of questions seem to have answers and the answers might last for a good long time until somebody does a new experiment or discovers something new and then all of a sudden, hmm, maybe that wasn't the right answer after all. So a scientist is always somewhat flexible and willing to to sort of go a different direction in order to find a better answer maybe, if there is a better answer to be found, or if the last one doesn't quite hang together after you've learned something new. So flexibility is a good thing. Scientists are skeptical, they're curious, all the things that kids are. <clears throat> so tools are important. Often in my profession, it takes new tools to find answers to good questions. This also goes to the core of our humanity, or even to a chimp's chimp-manity. <laughs> um, we're not only curious, we're also tool builders. And astronomers don't just reinvent the wheel. Um, inspired by star-filled skies and a desire to know when to plant and harvest, we've been we've been doing things astronomical for literally millennia. So here's a picture of Stonehenge dating back to about 3,800 years ago or so. And Stonehenge actually has astronomical aspects to it in terms of planet alignment, where the sun shines at a certain time of the year, um, the various alignments of, of these huge rocks that people went to tremendous trouble to pile up in this pattern. Um, that goes back a good long way. And more recently, but still quite a long time ago, there are Mayan temples. So this one uh, is the temple at Chichen Itza, about which I am no expert at all. But as it's told, the alignments of various, um, various configurations here, this critter up front, um, that's all positioned so that at a certain time of the year during the equinox, and I assume maybe that, I'm not even sure if that's the vernal or the autumnal equinox, but um, during the equinox, whichever one that is, near a sunset, a shadow is cast so that it comes down the side of the pyramid steps and winds up at the snake head. Now that's pretty amazing. That goes back a good long way to the year 515 AD or so. Four centuries ago, Galileo built himself a telescope, and I'm sure you've probably all heard that. And he used it to discover the moons of Jupiter. And this is somewhat of a view that might have been similar to Galileo's view 400 years ago. So here's Jupiter in the middle and its four largest moons. We now call them the Gal Galilean satellites of Jupiter but they're moons of Jupiter. They're orbiting around Jupiter, and he could see from day to day the changes in the positions of the moons, and that was telling him, ah, those are orbiting around Jupiter. So by virtue of discovering that, 
he sort of immediately, well, he got himself into a wee bit of trouble, actually, because he elevated Copernicus's thought that the Earth is not the center of the universe. Clearly, not everything orbits around the Earth. The Galilean moons are orbiting around Jupiter. So, anyway, that's not what's going on. Things are not all revolving around us. So ever since Galileo's time, astronomers have been building increasingly powerful telescopes. This one's the Hubble Space Telescope, launched in 1990 and serviced by astronauts five times since then. It's an extraordinarily powerful telescope, as I imagine many of you know. The universe teases us with questions, and we can't resist the hunt. We're driven. When we need to, which is pretty often, we even invent new technologies. And now when I say we, I mean my astronomical colleagues and I, and our engineering colleagues and technology developers. In fact, some of the most powerful medical imaging techniques used by doctors came from astronomers. This is one of the spin-offs, but I'm not really here to kind of brag about our spin-offs. I'm really here to tell you more about the connection between our human nature and what we're doing in space. And I'll get there. Um, so first, let's see. The universe is far too vast to explore through visitation. We can't go everywhere we might want to go. But even the most distant objects in the universe send us light. We have to make the most of the light, so we build telescopes to collect light and sensitive instruments to dissect the light into zillions of different colors. Rainbows remind us that light comes in a variety of colors, but there is a good deal more to light than meets the eye. So I have a little, there's more to this than meets the eye too. <laughs> I have a little video here, which I hope plays. I'm going to turn my audio on because maybe you'll hear it, but it's probably almost in inaudible to you. Let's see what happens light here. What we see with our limited vision is actually just a tiny portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Think of it this way. If the spectrum were a piano keyboard with 60 <coughs> octaves, the visible colors would span less than one octave. Not exactly a grand range for the cosmic symphony. Think about how much you would gain if you could hear all these octaves. So I hope that that helped to illustrate for you the idea that the electromagnetic spectrum, light of all different kinds, more or less goes on and on in both directions out from the central rainbow that our eyes can see. Um, so, of course, you've heard of X-rays and you see warnings to avoid the sun's UV radiation, um, putting on sunblock, and you might listen to the radio, warm your food in a microwave oven, and keep it warm under an infrared lamp. All of those things, X-rays, radio waves, microwaves, um, UV, they're all parts, they're all forms of light or electromagnetic radiation, and they're the things that are off the edges of the keyboard. So we gather, analyze, and theorize about the light that comes to us from the universe, and we've made amazing discoveries. Over the past few decades, we've pretty much completed the initial reconnaissance mission We've surveyed the sky in just about every color you can imagine, from radio waves at the top of this chart. This is, this is a picture of the Milky Way galaxy in many, many different colors, all the way from radio waves to gamma rays. Each part of the electromagnetic spectrum, or light for short, tells us something different. And all the puzzle pieces come together to tell us a story. And sometimes they don't tell us an obvious story, and we have to researched more to understand. So here, just to give you a little bit of a synopsis, um, right here is optical light. So th this is a panorama of the Milky Way galaxy. You have to imagine that this whole, each one of these rectangles is a strip in the sky that goes all around you. You can look in every direction. Um, imagine the Earth wasn't blocking your view. You could look that way too. Look all around you and the Milky Way is a flat disk and it, it forms a flat band in the sky. And if you have been so fortunate as to go out in a few miles outside of Harrisonburg, you can probably see the Milky Way. And it should look to you roughly like this picture here, 
third one up from the bottom. Now if you had x-ray vision, you would see that picture, the one down below the optical. And x-rays tell you something entirely different. In the optical, you see these dark, dusty features. Um, those are actually close by in our Milky Way, and they block the starlight that are, that's on the far side of them. Um, in x-rays, you see a trace of that too. But you see many individual objects, and they tend to be very energetic things, like exploding objects and stars. And they will tend to pop off like little flashing bulbs on a Christmas tree. Um, at gamma rays, you see something different, and I'm not going to spend time going through every single one of these things, but I hope you get the impression that we use all of the electromagnetic spectrum. We see a different picture in each of the different colors, and we learn something different about our universe by studying it in all of its different kinds of light. <coughs> Excuse me just a second. So we've learned a lot, and we've learned to ask new questions that couldn't have even been asked before. For example, what is the mysterious dark energy that behaves like anti-gravity and makes the universe fly apart at an accelerating pace? So dark energy actually is a, is a relatively new discovery or rediscovery of a thought that Einstein had uh, in the turn of the last century. Um, and once again, I'm not going to go into any detail here and now, but suffice it to say that dark energy seems to be about three quarters of everything in the universe, and yet we know almost nothing about it, and it's not the stuff we can see. And other questions that we might want to ask uh, that have persisted uh, despite our efforts to answer them. For example, when did the first stars and galaxies form, and how did galaxies change over time? Or why does the Earth have oceans? How are the conditions for habitability established when planets form? This might come as a surprise. Some scientists have another natural human quality. They're social animals. <laughs> Revelations tonight, I'm sure. Um, to build our powerful telescopes and instruments to solve our puzzles, we collaborate with engineers, technologists, and our fellow scientists all around the world. Um, one of the you know, fun phrases that people often recite when I'm introduced to them and somebody is told what my career is as an astronomer or astrophysicist, they'll, they'll say, oh, you're a rocket scientist. And I say, no, the rocket scientists are engineers. Rockets are machines, and engineers build those, but we work with them. <coughs> I'd be lying if I told you that this wasn't fun. It is fun, and I want to share that with you. I think you deserve to participate in this adventure, so I'm going to spend a few minutes telling you about the WISE story. So WISE is um, actually, I think you heard Chenille mention uh, in the introduction uh, that I serve as the WISE mission scientist for NASA. WISE is, a, is one of our space telescope projects. It's an infrared telescope. Uh, it has surveyed the entire sky in the infrared. And let's see, what did I say on here? Um, this all started with a proposal to NASA, which convinced NASA that it was important to make this investment. Um, so WISE surveyed the entire sky, and it samples the smallest, coolest, and possibly the nearest stars, things that are actually stars, but they're no warmer than you and I. Um, it also finds uh, the most luminous galaxies in the universe, looking out to great distances to find them. And WISE will help us to prepare for a next generation of telescopes that can point to individual objects and study them in great detail with extraordinary sensitivity. WISE doesn't have that capability. It did have the capability, however, of looking everywhere. So it's part of this reconnaissance mission that I mentioned. So we did invest in WISE. We built WISE. It's a tiny little telescope, about this big, but it's extremely cold, about 
12 degrees above absolute zero and it orbits in space. Um, infrared radiation of these wavelengths for the most part doesn't even penetrate the atmosphere and reach the ground and even if it did at some wavelengths in the infrared, um, everything around us, including us, glows brightly in the infrared, including a telescope on the ground, the atmosphere that you would have to look through, all the people doing the observing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the best place to put an infrared telescope is in space, above the atmosphere, and make it very cold so the telescope itself is not glowing brightly. So that's what we did. Um, that's one of the reasons NASA gets interested in doing astronomical things, because there are things that can be done only in space. <clears throat> so. WISE is an infrared space telescope, but I really want you to notice that this is a people story. So here's a people. Uh, this particular person is working on the telescope, and you can get a feeling for how large it is, not very large. It has the power, however, of, of much, much larger telescopes on the ground um, because we'll put it in space. We did put it in space. Here's a person assembling that mirror into a telescope. A person working on a scanning mechanism that keeps as wise orbits the Earth, it's constantly in motion, but we want to take a series of snapshots, so we need something to make little freeze frames. So we built into WISE a scanning mirror that keeps a particular little patch of sky um, locked still for about 11 seconds at a time, and then it jumps to a new spot. So that's what that little scanning mechanism does. And there's a person involved in making that, of course, and testing it. Um, one of the things that really made WISE possible were the infrared detectors. And even though there's not a person in that picture, you can well imagine that people made it. So here are a couple of people who are um, assembling uh, the telescope, which is up here on top. And they're putting it into this gigantic thermos bottle, gigantic about the size of a person. And that's the thing that keeps it cold. So inside that thermos bottle, there's actually a substance called solid hydrogen, which is pretty weird. Hydrogen's usually a gas. Um, but if you cool it down enough, you can turn it into a block of ice. It becomes solid, and it's extremely cold, like 12 degrees above absolute zero. So that's what makes WISE cold, and it only lasts as long as it lasts. Eventually, it does boil off and go away. But that thermos bottle thing is designed to hold the solid hydrogen and keep the telescope cold and the detectors. Um, so here is a uh, test facility. Once again, I mean, no details here, but I want you to see the people. There are people that make this stuff happen, lots and lots of them. Um, there were people who were involved in putting the entire thing together and testing it. This is what we call the payload. So inside that is the telescope. and. This is actually a different part of why it's called the spacecraft. In addition to the telescope and the thing that keeps it cold, you need a spacecraft that knows, that can communicate with you. Uh, so we can send commands up to the spacecraft. It can send the data back to the ground. Uh, this helps to steer WISE as it orbits the Earth. Um, it helps with the electronics that control the various, the mechanisms, the detectors, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it has a star tracker that tells you at any given point in time, oh, I know where I'm looking, I know where I'm looking, etc. Um, here are some people who are a happy science team. One of these people might actually be me, but I, I can't even tell to tell you the truth. <laughs> I have to look closely. Um, this is the WISE science team gathered in two different uh, sessions because they couldn't fit us all into the room at once, um, standing in front of the fully assembled flight system, which is the telescope and its doer to keep it cold, and the spacecraft, all together just about ready to send off to be stuck on top of a rocket and launched. And that's pretty much what it looked like at that stage. Um, over here, you know, here's another important spacecraft component. That's a solar array. A lot of people have those on their roofs now, collecting sunlight and turning it into electricity. We need electricity to power the systems here, too. Um, at the very top of this thing that looks like R2-D2 is a, a dome uh, that keeps um, the, the entire thing clean and cold up until you get into space, and then that will be ejected. Um, now, we had to get that thing into the top of a rocket. 
And here's what it looks like when you put it in the top of the rocket. So this is actually what we call a rocket fairing. It's like the nozzle at the very top of a rocket. And you can see that WISE itself fills a pretty good chunk of that, but not quite the whole thing. Here's what the rocket looked like. So WISE is sitting up here. And this goes on and on for quite a good distance down into the floor. <laughs> And you can kind of get a sense of how far down it is. It's really amazing. This was the first time I ever attended a launch of one of NASA's space missions. And still, the so far, the only time. But I do hope to do it again. It was really fun, really exciting. And it's a lot like watching a model rocket launch, <laughs> except it's a heck of a lot bigger and uh, very impressive. Um, so here's uh, the Delta II rocket. This was launched out of uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base in California on December 14, 2009. Here's a team, not the entire team, but once again you can see people. These are lots of happy people the night before launch. Happy and a little nervous. Um, some of those people are even us. My wife and I are somewhere on the far right there. Um, and. Uh, this was just half a day away from launch. Um, and like I said, a lot of people, but not all the WISE team. In fact, the principal investigator, the one who's really in charge of the show, in addition to the project manager and other people, the principal investigator, Ned Wright from, the, from UCLA, wasn't in this picture because he was busy preparing for the next morning. So here's how WISE looked when it launched in December 2009. And here's how it looks when you look at it in the infrared. And let's see if I can make this work. I think I can. So this is a little infrared movie. If you had infrared eyes, this is what the WISE launch would look like. A little nerve-wracking for us. We were really happy to see it go up successfully. Not every single rocket launch is successful, but almost every single Delta II rocket launch has been successful. It's been a great program. And um, that was a whole lot of fun, as I hope you can sort of get that sense. Um, so once WISE is up in orbit, it orbits around the Earth. It's always looking outward from the Earth. And it's always scanning the sky. It's in constant motion. It goes the whole way around the Earth roughly every hour and a half. It gave us over a million individual calibrated images. Here you can see the whole sky, Milky Way in the middle. And this is wise as it's going around and around, taking swaths out of the sky as it orbits the Earth. And as the Earth orbits the Sun, it sweeps out a path. And over six months, it covers the entire sky. So it not only covered the whole sky, it gave us over a million individual calibrated images and a catalog of something like 530 million individual objects, things like stars and galaxies, and many pretty pictures, which you can enjoy. And you can enjoy them by going to that website, or just Google WISE, and you'll find them. So WISE looked everywhere. It's answering some of our questions. For example, we found a new class of stars, the very coolest so-called brown dwarf stars, which turn out to be no warmer than you or this room. And we completed a census of potentially hazardous near-Earth objects, asteroids that are orbiting the sun close enough to the Earth that they have the potential to actually hit us one of those things wiped out the dinosaurs. So we sort of like to know where they are and how many there are. <laughs> so that was important. And we found new comets. Um, my postdoctoral research ass assistant, Xavier Koenig, um, learned something interesting about how some stars trigger other stars to form. And that's behind this picture. Actually, it'll be in front of the picture if I click. So if you zoom in on a, an object like this, this is a region in our Milky Way galaxy. So let me just go back and orient you a little bit. So this is a piece of our Milky Way galaxy. 
far from the whole thing. Um, and overall, this whole picture covers about 1 44th of the entire sky. So there's a lot more to what Wise saw, but this happens to be a particularly interesting region. And within this region of our Milky Way galaxy, there are especially interesting objects like the ones that are circled here. So now I'm going to zoom in and tell you a little bit about what my research assistant did. So he looked at objects like this region where some very massive stars, the most massive stars, have formed and they're pushing on the interstellar clouds of gas and dust that gave birth to the stars. And as they're doing that, they seem to be triggering new generations of stars to form. So I'm not going to tell you every single little thing that he learned about them, but he studied how they're distributed in space and learned something about this triggering process. It's an example, a fine example actually, of what WISE data can be used for. But if you zoom in even further, you see little objects like that. And they're, they're all over the place. And if you were to go into any part of that big background picture, you can find things like that. Those are really interesting objects. Some people call them pillars. And within those things, new stars are forming. So I really want to know how planets form and how some of them wind up being like our own planet, a comfortable, habitable place so far. We should keep it that way. To learn how this works, we're going to need much more powerful telescopes than WISE. WISE was designed to look everywhere. It had a certain sensitivity, but not the most extraordinary possible sensitivity for staring at a particular interesting object and not very great resolution. So even though you can zoom pretty far into a picture like this and see things like that, you can't really zoom any farther and see any more without something more powerful than WISE. But we contemplate things that are quite a bit more powerful than WISE, one of which is called the James Webb Space Telescope, which is due to be launched by NASA. And it's a collaboration between NASA and its European partner and Canadian partner, for that matter. Um, in uh, European Space Agency and Canadian Space Agency. So James Webb Space Telescope is the successor project to Hubble. And it's designed to provide extraordinary sensitivity but at longer wavelengths than the Hubble telescope does. So Hubble is designed to look at wavelengths that are the same as the wavelengths that our eyes see and just a little bit longer. Um, James Webb will go quite a bit farther into the infrared and cover essentially the same wavelengths or colors that WISE covers. But as you'll see when I play this animation here, this is James Webb all sort of rolled up so that it can be squeezed into one of those rocket shrouds and launched. But you're going to see in a moment that it's going to open up and unfurl into an amazing telescope that I would say is pretty close to the size of this room. So let's see if I can make this movie play. So this is showing the deployment of James Webb. You'll get the impression that this is pretty sophisticated, complex stuff. And as you can imagine, it's got to have to be tested to exhaustion on the ground so we have every bit of confidence that it's going to work once it's up in space. So in 2018, if all goes according to plan, maybe I should just stop for a second and point out a few things. So the telescope itself is, is curled up like a dining room table with leaves. And those leaves, you know, as you'll see, are going to unfold. And this thing is called a sun shield, which has multiple layers. It's designed to keep the telescope cold for the same reason WISE had to be cold, although this won't be quite as cold. It'd be a little too hard to do that because it's so enormous. Um, so you can see all the various aspects of the deployment here. And now toward the end, you're going to see the two leaves on the sides open up. And you'll have one very large telescope made up of 18 different panels in hexagons that all stitch together to make a six and a half meter diameter telescope the size of this room. You can start to see where that's going to happen here. That's a se so-called secondary mirror that this one collects the light and sends it into the secondary mirror. And I'll back up and show you that a little bit more. You can see the multiple layered sun shield. Each layer gets a little bit colder than the one before it. The sun is shining from up on the bottom there. 
I think maybe this will black out, but I will back it up. Okay, so I'm going to back it up just half a step here so I can... Okay, so the light would be collected from some distant object out here, collected by this enormous telescope, brought up to this secondary mirror, and then focused down inside the hole here into an instrument chamber located on the back. So that's quite a beast and very impressive. We have a, uh, a well, not we, NASA, but Northrop Grumman, who is our prime contractor for this telescope, built a, a full-scale model that they've carried to places all over the world uh, to exhibit, here's what it's going to look like. And at one point, we had that model at Goddard, where I work, and we had people standing all around it, just like the people gathering for the WISE launch. And the people are like, you know, little, little dots compared <laughs> to this thing. Um, it's really huge. So, <clears throat> let's see, where did I leave off here? Um, so, James Webb, I mentioned it's the successor to Hubble. Um, it's designed to have extraordinary sensitivity to see galaxies back to the time when they first formed, when the universe was still a baby universe. It will operate in the infrared like WISE, but it will have much better vision than WISE, so we'll be able to see some of the details inside those little specks of light that represent forming stars and planetary systems. And new telescopes working at l even longer wavelengths than JWST, this one, some in space and some on the ground, will help to complete the picture. So that was my parting thought. Enjoy the journey, and thank you for being here. And I would, thanks. I would really welcome your questions because questions are where it all starts. Yes. Test things on the ground, yes. Okay, um, I'll question because I'm not sure that, that the voices all carry. Um, so how do we test things on the ground and how can we make things on the ground? How can we test them like they'll be in space? So that is a really, really excellent question. Um, and NASA actually has a policy which we strive to implement uh, as best we can um, or get as close to it as we can. And the policy is called test as you fly. And as you can imagine, space is not a very easy environment to simulate on the ground. You've got nasty radiation cosmic rays squirting all around that can do things to your instruments. You've got a vacuum of space. Um, it can be hot if you're illuminated by the sun, or it can be extraordinarily cold, or you can go from one extreme to the other. So we actually, despite all that, do a pretty good job of testing things like that. Um, we build enormous vacuum chambers, pump out all the air, uh, make it like the vacuum of space. Um, you saw one of those pictures go by with people in it testing one of the wise instruments, we call that the Bluetooth. Um, that particular test wasn't in a vacuum chamber, it was just testing some of the optical uh, aspects. How does light get through the system and does it make it from one end to the other the way you would expect it to? Is everything properly aligned? So it, there are many, many different tests, many different kinds of tests. Some of them are designed to, make, to simulate the environment of space. And like I said, you can't always get all the way as far as you'd like to go. So a good example of where you have to compromise is when you get to something like James Webb Space Telescope inside of this room. Well, it's really hard to find a vacuum chamber that's bigger than that to stick James Webb in and test it out. But lo and behold, uh, back in the Apollo days, NASA at its Johnson Space Center uh, in, in uh, Houston did actually build a vacuum chamber like that because we wanted to make darn sure that the capsule we were going to stick astronauts in and send them to the moon was safe. So it turns out that that chamber uh, is in the process of being converted to a test facility for James Webb. And even though not the absolute entire assembled James Webb will be tested there with its sum sheet, which are just cute, they're the size of a tennis court, 
Um, I think the plan is to take the rest of it, basically the optical telescope, and test it here and make sure it's aligned properly and works in an environment similar to the space environment. Mm -hmm. Yes? You mentioned with the So how, why is this cooled with a, uh, a, a thermos bottle full of solid hydrogen? And um, I mentioned that that hydrogen boils away and disappears, and you're wondering how would we refill it? Um, we would love to be able to refill it, but the answer is we can't, because it's up there, always orbiting the Earth. We have no way of visiting it and refilling it. Um, if we could do that, we would get more valuable data about it. In fact, it's not designed for that, and we can't reach it and do that. Um, so this particular thing has re and that's true of most infrared telescopes that we've built in the past, is that until now, we've always built them with this expendable substance. Sometimes it's liquid helium, sometimes, in this case, it's solid hydrogen. Uh, but once it's gone, it's gone, and the mission reaches an end. Um, there is a, uh, a really magnificent European space telescope called Herschel, an infrared telescope that's up there now, and uh, it's cooled, I think, by liquid helium. Um, Harold, maybe help me out. Okay, liquid helium, and it's got an awful lot of liquid helium, but enough to last a few years. Why has only lasted about 10 months or so? Um, but once the liquid helium is gone from Herschel, that mission is also at an end. So, the answer is we can't always reach these things with astronauts and refill them. There are people thinking about how to do that. Not necessarily how to, um, to refuel or cool um, infrared telescopes, but how to, uh, how to do refueling of rockets, essentially, in space, which involves some of the same kind of cryogenic substances. Um, so it could be that someday we'll get to the point where that is possible. But I actually think that a, um, a better way to go and that we seem to be in, is to use uh, a different approach altogether. Instead of something that does boil up and disappear and once it's gone, it's gone, um, you can use a mechanical cryocooler, which is sort of like a refrigerator on steroids. And so it's a mechanical device that's powered by sunlight through its solar cells, and um, that doesn't have the same kind of light limiting aspect to it. So a different approach, technology, that helps. What do you think the future holds for like, space travel? The future holds for space travel. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't even know where to begin. I know that there are, there are always are people thinking about this and have been for a long time. Um, are you thinking about near term, like in the next few decades, or long term? Next century. Next century. Well, I think to be realistic, what we would like to do in the next few decades is probably what we'll really do in the next century. So, so maybe I'll stop there. Um, and we can think about what might happen in the longer run. Um, in, the, in the next couple of decades, I think that our ambition is to send humans to Mars. I think initially to um, maybe to orbit Mars, the way we approach the moon. First, we send people into orbit around the moon. Uh, like putting a little toe in the water, and then we send people to the surface and we're going to walk back. Um, Mars would be a lot harder, it's a lot farther away. It takes at least something like eight months to get there, and another eight to get back or so. Um, and it's uh, not a particularly friendly environment, although it sure will be interesting to visit. So I think our, you know, for probably something like the coming century, a place like Mars is really the target. We talk about sending astronauts to an asteroid, and that may even happen. I mean, the, right now, the stated goal is to get people to Mars by about 2035. I don't know for sure that that'll happen, but that's what we're aiming for, uh, building the machinery to make that happen. And I think as part of that, uh, again, tipping, you know, putting a toe in the water, uh, part of the plan, I think, would be to put put astronauts onto an asteroid. Uh, it's a lot easier to take off from an asteroid than it is to take off from a, as, as massive a body as Mars, which has stronger gravity, well, much stronger than the moon. So it's going to be hard to get 
somebody could lift off from Mars and once they're there. Um, in the longer run, I think I can't speculate any better than you could. Um, uh, but, you know, we, there, one thing that, you know, I, has always scandalized people is, uh, you know, are there different modes of travel? Can you step into a uh, time mode or uh, a wormhole or whatever and get somewhere fast, even equivalent to faster than the speed of light? And nobody's found such a thing yet, but sure it's an intriguing possibility. So if such a thing ever should be discovered, then traveling, you know, to distances that right now we can't even imagine might become possible. That's that's just in the realm of speculation. You know? And if you think about space travel by humans in the context of our own Milky Way galaxy, um, everything we've visited until now, the moon, actually I just traded in, I didn't even sell it yet, a Honda that has like 235,000 miles on it. That's the distance to the moon, roughly. So you can actually drive to the moon. <laughs> Takes a while. Um, but Mars is much, much farther away than that. And so what we're talking about is, you know, just gradually merging out into our own solar system, which is nothing but a speck compared to the entire Milky Way galaxy. Milky Way is nothing but a speck compared to all the other specks of the galaxies in the universe. So space travel, so far as we can do anything other than just imagine, is going to be limited to a you know, pretty small area unless you wait many, many generations and you know send the first generation a little distance, the next generation a bigger distance, etc., etc. And over however many generations some human descendants may wind up far, far away. So there are people thinking about stuff like that too, for the long run. Yes, in the back. Um, will the James Webb Telescope be used to help the SETI program at all? Will the James Webb Space Telescope help the SETI program? So the yeah. SETI program is a search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And um, that's been a sort of on, and on again, off again thing with uh, federal funding sometimes and not at all for quite a while now. Uh, but it's been privately funded for, um, for a while, and um, it's looking around um, for signals from intelligent life elsewhere. Um, so, there, I don't know, there are different modes of help, I guess. Um, I think in terms of, um, if you ask it in terms of would you like to find intelligent life that's not very far, far away in the universe, so that maybe we can go there and visit whoever, um, then we pretty much know all the local places. James Webb is so powerful that it'll be able to see you know, practically to the edge of the universe to distances that are so far away that you know it's, it's like looking way out here, but the SETI program is looking for life down here. Um, so that's one <coughs> facet of the answer. Maybe a different facet of the answer is that there, there is such a thing as political health. And so any time that you do something that gets people excited about the concept, that's a form of help too. And uh, I think that, I hope we'll find when we launch James Webb, that even from the, from any standpoint, it's technical complexity and just, just making it work would be such a huge feat. And that, that alone will be inspirational, but the discoveries it will make, we can't even imagine, but we can guess a few, and those will also be extraordinarily inspirational. So I think the inspirational value of something like James Webb can carry an awful lot of other things along with it and get people intrigued about what's up there and who's up there. So maybe that's also an aspect of the answer. Yes? Um, my broad question is with your opinion on who owns space, but it's kind of a sub question that I would be things like um, how we manage all the space and jump with that. Thoughts on the use of space for military purposes or practical operations that are, you know, generating or setting things up for profit. Um, so, you know, NASA, I know you have lots of private partners, but certainly you're an extension of our government. So you're working with for us. So yes, it's, it's, I am absolutely working for you. And the spirit of your talk is wonderful. Thank you. We're all the same. Um, but some folks want to own 
Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm hearing a lot of questions all rolled up in one there. Um, <laughs> so I don't know that I'll, I'll do justice to uh, even any of them. But, um, let me take space junk as, a, as an, in, an interesting issue. So um, by now we've launched a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, some of that has gone to distances way outside of Earth orbit. But uh, for quite a long time, all of our launches have put things in the Earth orbit with just a few exceptions. So the junk is piling up, and actually the junk gets much, much worse when something either accidentally or deliberately plows into one piece of stuff in space and breaks it up into lots and lots of tiny little pieces that are still zipping around at such enormous speeds that if any one of those little things hits something else, if that new thing you know, is still functional, it may not be functional after it's hit. So space junk is a really big issue. Um, one thing, that, and this is not something I really know a whole lot about, other than what I read, and I didn't even stay at a holiday in last night. <laughs> um, but let me give it a shot. Um, so I do know that NASA has a program, I think it's called NIAC, another acronym, um, NASA Institute for Advanced Concepts, or something like that. So these can be really out of the, out of the box thinking concepts, a little bit like DARPA. Uh, you know, that DARPA, which funds, uh, it's another government agency that funds really out of the box thinking concepts and uh, they've done extraordinary things. So, through this NASA NIAC program, I do know that um, they are contemplating something that I've heard described as a net to capture, uh, sort of rustle up a lot of the space junk and somehow send it back down to the ground, burns up in the atmosphere, probably solved to some degree. And the other thing that I read and heard about this is that at this point the problem is still manageable, challenging but manageable. The longer we wait and the more space junk there is, the harder and harder it gets. So it's not a problem that we want to wait a long time to solve. Um, and fortunately we are thinking about how to solve it. Um, <laughs> okay. um, certainly there are other interests in space. Maybe we can come back to some of the other questions. Thanks. Yes. Um, can you talk about how you... Oh, okay. sorry. I saw a gentleman behind you. That's fine. I'm go sorry. Ahead. Okay. No, no, no. Go ahead. That's fine. I'll come to you next. Can you talk a little bit about how you chose your career and what you might uh, recommend for young people who aspire to work for NASA? Oh, I wish I brought that whole slide with me. Um, sure. Um, I can tell you that um, from the time I was at eight years old, I pretty much knew that this is what I wanted to do. Sort of, not exactly this. I couldn't have told you infrared astrophysics. I would have said I wanted to, you know, build rockets and send stuff into space. Um, and at that time, um, I was born in 1957. I was very much inspired by the Apollo program, the, the Gemini and Mercury programs that preceded it. Um, all the things that we were doing in space, but not only the, the sending of people into space. Um, I, uh, this, is, <laughs> this is a funny little thing, but I love to confess it. Um, when I was a little kid, something like 8 or 10 or 12 years old, I used to write to NASA. Now that's sort of a weird concept. What does it mean to write to NASA? I don't, somehow, there was no internet, right? But somehow I found somebody's address, and I would say, I would, I'm really interested in planets. Please send me pictures. Tell me about what you're doing in space. And people actually sent stuff back. <laughs> um, and that had an enormous impact. Um, it, it was really just amazing that you know I felt empowered. Um, and let's see. And another thing that I that I like to highlight is that. Through my, well, let's see, went through high school, obviously, all the rest. At every stage of my educational career, I had a mentor who I can point to and still think very fondly of um, as somebody who really just spurred me on. I mean, I had the fire in me, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that alone would have done it. So mentors are really key. Um, and, you know, a, a mentor can be anywhere, I suppose. Um, but uh, throughout, certainly high school, college, graduate school, and then as a postdoc, uh, where I did a postdoc at NASA, actually, um, at each 
state, but it's including the one or two key people who made an enormous difference. Um, I, I'll also confess I wasn't an avid reader, but I just loved to read um, science-like books and stuff. That, I think there was a series of books when I was growing up, a, a how-to series or something like that. So it was you know, all sorts of stuff like that. I didn't read much science fiction, lots of, um, lots of how-to kinds of things, and how does it work kind of things. Um, so mentors, yeah, what else can I say? Internships, I didn't hear where that came from, but internships, thank you. Um, internships, yes. Um, uh, in college, summers, um, I had, a, had quite a good internship. Um, a lot of that really, I felt, was tied back to my college mentor who, you know, would sort of say, why don't you try this, why don't you try that? So the internship was extremely valuable, but it was the mentor who said, go try that do it. Um, what else can I say? I, I think that's actually the, the gist of it. Um, I've been in this since I was little, never lost it. Sort of like being a little kid and not growing up. The curiosity is just there. <laughs> um, does that do it for you? Please let us be able to keep supporting <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll stop with that. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry, I'll still come back to you. Go ahead. So, I just have a specific question about the question. How long did you guys something like WISE? Uh, it's a really great question. Um, for something like WISE, I can uh, tell you it started in, I think it was 1999, with the first proposal. Um, it's almost always true that in cases like this, the first proposal doesn't cut the mustard and you have to try again. So a year or two went by and you try again and it worked. Um, so that, I didn't get involved in WISE until later on after the proposal was accepted. Um, because that's when it became an you know, official NASA project. Um, and so from 1999 until 2009 when it was launched, and then it operated for roughly another year, and we're still collecting and analyzing data. Well, not collecting, but we're analyzing data now and publishing papers. So figure 1999 till now, and that's for WISE. And WISE is actually in the, in the context of the kinds of things that NASA does, that's actually a pretty smallish mission. If you look at the big thing, like Hubble, um, James Webb is still on its way, so I can't even tell you how long it will take. I can only tell you that we're hoping to get it up there in 2018. And I can also tell you that it takes longer than like <coughs> more, and that would be a really bad thing. You don't want that to happen. You do it. Um, but Hubble and uh, its other companion, so-called great observatories, are much more, much more expensive than wise. Um, and those could literally take decades. Um, I mean, several decades from the time an idea enters somebody's head and they say, why don't we do this? It takes decades before that thing actually goes up. Um, I'll come back to you, but I think, yep, sorry. I was, uh, I was wondering your thoughts on I think, yeah, I think it's technically feasible, but I don't think I can tell you exactly how it's supposed to work. I think it has something to do with sending something up and dangling a, a thing from a tether all the way to the ground from space, and then using that as a so-called space elevator to, to lift things into space orbit. So that's the principle of it, but exactly how that works, I'm not sure. But I think it is thought to be feasible. Okay, what, oh, yes, thanks. Kind of going off of her question, how long have, have you guys been like planning or like making a project? 
responses uh, for uh, the web.
or you know you might read it in a book or in a newspaper or see it on a store shelf in a grocery store but is it really true so critical thinking is critical to the success of our democracy um so i guess i tend to be optimistic i think that there's plenty of room for that to come back and i think the reason it would come back is that it's such a good idea <coughs> It'd be fun to have a longer conversation with you about that later. Okay. Thanks. Yes. I'm looking forward to that thing is to apply something called the Master Chico Bell and the Festival of the Nation. No. Okay, so you're you're referring to um a NASA policy, a previous NASA policy called Faster, Better, Cheaper. Um, we had a, an earlier NASA administrator, an administrator like the president of NASA in a sense, uh, Ted Honcho. Um, the previous administrator, this goes back a couple of uh, generations now, the administrator was Dan Bolden, and that was his policy. And the idea was we were spending lots and lots of money on these programs, and largely speaking, we were spending lots of money because we were spending lots of time and effort on the ground testing them and testing them and testing them and making sure they were going to work when we launched them. And his idea was, well, let's take more risk and not worry about, well, every now and then we'll have a failure, but that's okay. And let's build things faster. And if we build them faster, they become naturally cheaper because actually the cost of the NASA <coughs> mission we build is all about keeping what we call marching army costs. It's all the people involved you have to pay for them. And if a project takes a long time and you've got a lot of people, then it takes a lot of money. And if you can take that same group of people and make things happen faster because maybe you don't test it as much, it becomes cheaper, but also riskier. So it was a known risk, and in his era, we decided to accept that risk, and it had some consequences which we didn't like. Um, so you, you might imagine that um, uh, a certain amount of risk is okay because you want to compromise and not spend a fortune. Um, but you can also imagine that if you spend anything like half a fortune and it fails, then people really start ruling you and it doesn't look so good. So that idea went out the window. And now we test pretty thoroughly. And maybe in consequence, things like these you know, cost a fortune. <laughs> but they work. to learn how to send rockets with people into near-Earth orbit. 
so to places like the space station. And that's all the space shuttle has ever done in the entire life of the space shuttle program. We've only ever gone into Earth orbit. Um, it's been since the Apollo program ended that we left Earth orbit and went to the moon. Um, the other thing that NASA is doing, though, is investing in a heavy lift rocket and a, uh, an astronaut capsule that's a lot like the Apollo capsule, it's called the Orion, uh, that's designed to hold, I've lost track of how many astronauts, maybe seven at a time, a bunch, a small bunch. Um, and that heavy lift rocket with the Orion capsule on top, sometime in roughly the next half decade, I think is supposed to, I, well, not even that. I think in the next maybe five-ish years or so, so half a decade, uh, it's supposed to make maybe its maiden trip without people on board starting to be tested out. So it's going to be maybe eight, ten years before we're sending astronauts into deep space. Uh, commercially, though, hopefully within, within a year or so, I think it's realistic. Uh, so they say, if all goes well, um, that we'll have commercial uh, private businesses launching astronauts into low Earth orbit. And then hopefully in about a decade, we'll be sending astronauts into deep space. Sort of like the space plane. Like the space plane. Space plane in China. Right, okay, so a suborbital kind of thing, but yes, mm -hmm. that's also a problem. Mm -hmm. Other questions, or not? maybe we're pushing it on time here? We'll take one more. We'll take one more. Just one more. Yeah. We'll see one in the back. Has Wise aided in the search for extrasolar planets? Has Wise aided in the search for extrasolar planets? Um, not directly. I'm trying to think if I can stretch it and make an indirect connection. I would say it would be a pretty tenuous connection, so I'll just say no to be fair. Um, we do have another NASA mission that's designed specifically for that, and that's called the Kepler mission. So. Not any one of our missions does the same thing, that's why we need more than one. So Kepler does that. Okay. All right, let's take, thank our speaker, Jeff.